Welcome to the Educate, Empower, and Evolve podcast. I'm Haley Vera, holistic lifestyle coach and founder of Health Pillars Online Lifestyle Coaching. I started this podcast to share the knowledge that has helped hundreds of my clients take control of their health and step into their power. I believe that true empowerment stems from a deep understanding of your body and mind. And my hope is that this podcast will provide you the education and knowledge you need to make lasting change in your life. I want you to not only feel better, but become your absolute best self by optimizing your internal health and going beyond the physical realm, mastering your mindset and developing a strong connection with your inner being. If you want to evolve and perform not only at a high level in your personal and professional life, but also experience a profound sense of fulfillment and purpose, then you are in the right place. I'm committed to helping you live a life that reflects your truest capabilities. Thank you for tuning in. Now let's dive into today's episode. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the E3 podcast. I'm your host, Haley, and today I have brought back a very special guest and obviously one of my favorite people, um, Jake. Mm. So, Jake, hello. Welcome back to the podcast. Hello. Thank you for bringing me back again. Of course. So, Jake is obviously my partner and also one of our master coaches on the team here at Health Pillars. He is a wealth of knowledge, and interestingly enough, we share very similar backgrounds with disordered eating and body dysmorphia. And so I actually brought him on the podcast today to talk with me about um, eating, essentially, and the different kind of types of eating. So the way that I look at it, there's basically homeostatic eating and hedonic eating. And of course, there's going to be more nuances than just those two things. But those are the two kind of primary focuses that we are going to have today. Um, because I think we can kind of split most eating into one of those two categories, okay? So let's uh, just kind of talk a little bit about those terms actually mean first. And so let's start off with explaining hedonic eating. Can you explain what hedonic eating is for us, Jake? Yeah, so it's eating rather eating for pleasure, essentially, rather than to balance to to require your to to fulfill your energy requirements or what they call homeostasis, right? So, eating for pleasure to make you feel a certain way, right? It has nothing mm -hmm. to do with eating because you're per se hungry. I believe yes. that's the right term for it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So basically uh, eating for pleasure is basically a simple term rather than necessity, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of times eating in terms of like hedonic eating can be triggered by um, stress as an example, um, social situations. I know it's summertime right now and there are more like backyard barbecues and camping trips and pool parties and stuff. That kind of like almost buffet style eating when there's just food laid out in front of you can be really challenging to navigate, right? But I also think that hedonic eating for a lot of people has to do with boredom, right? In the evening, kind of bored, sitting on the couch, looking for that little bit of sweetness or the saltiness, the crunchiness. Uh, and so that's when we start to choose foods for pleasure. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how food manufacturers actually booby trap us into hedonic eating um, with how the foods are actually created with these like hyper palatable foods. We'll talk about that in a little bit more depth um, further into the podcast. But now let's talk about what homeostatic eating is. And what's, what's your definition of homeostatic eating, Jake? Yeah, that's very hard these days, I guess. Uh, I don't think most people can understand their actual hunger signals and eat to satiety and nourishment. I think that's what it is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think what you mentioned before, a lot of us are eating because, and I think this is a big conversation, the hyper palatability of foods, mm -hmm. completely essentially hardwires are, are hormones that regulate hunger. So we're just eating a ton of calories and not getting nutrients. Now for eating single, for the most part, single ingredient whole foods, we're eating for nourishment, meaning things that are essential for the human body, right? Protein and fat, right? And our body and vitamins and minerals. And if our body isn't getting that from food, then sometimes it'll want to seek other foods to fulfill those requirements. Um, that's why obviously the way that we, re we recommend people eat, they fulfill those requirements and certain supplements play a role and you'll be satisfied. You're not going to be eating till complete fullness and discomfort. I think mm -hmm. that's what it is. And so for myself, I struggled with my relationship with food for a long time, like yourself. And for me, um, it was interesting because my eating patterns were more so related to food avoidance than hedonic eating, like eating for pleasure. 
Um, I was, even when I was at my worst in terms of like bulimia, I wasn't really seeking out like bins of ice cream, right. Or going through the drive store or getting like multiple different candy bars. Um, I would just like overeat to the point of feeling sick, whatever it was, even if it was a healthy meal, because I'd starve myself for so long. So a lot of my eating patterns were actually driven by my relationship with my body and what I saw in the mirror. And so if I was unhappy with what I saw in the mirror, when I woke up, well, then that meant extra cardio and no food for the day. Right. And that was kind of how I operated, but that's not how um, I would necessarily, I would consider that hedonic eating necessarily. I would say that's like the avoidance of homeostatic, homeostatic eating, where you're almost like avoiding that balance and trying to force yourself to be hungry because you think that that's what's going to help you to see fat loss. So I would almost put that kind of eating into the homeostatic or the avoidance of homeostatic eating because you're trying to feel hungry on purpose, right? And it's almost like sadistic in a way where you're like torturing yourself um, to do that. But I know that your relationship with food is more on the other side where you did tend to eat for pleasure. So can you talk a little bit about that and maybe even give us an example of that? Yeah, it was a bit of both, actually. It was somewhat of what you did, but then I would overeat usually in the evenings and then <laughs> and then I would vomit, right? So I did it because of a lot of factors. A lot of it began in my earlier, I came from an overweight background, but then when I started getting into bodybuilding, I'd get on these regimented diet plans and eating a certain way. And then it all started when I wanted to compete the first time and a lot of restriction and a lot of activity plus working a lot. So a lot of stress just accumulated and that's essentially when it started. And I realized I was, when I was dieting and I was eating barely any calories and exercising two, three hours a day on top of a physical job, it's just the body can't handle that, right? And I tried to fight that. I tried to fight that and it didn't work. And it would just be a lot of food in the evening. It started with more of what I was eating, more portion sizes, and that was just not enough, right? I definitely was not getting that homeostatic signal. My body was seriously stressed, deprived, and burning through all sorts of vitamins and minerals. I didn't know at that time. So I was just seeking food, right? I was just seeking anything, just calories at that point in time. And then it just amalgamated into serious eating disorders, right? Just overeating and then feeling guilty and ashamed because I wouldn't do it in the house. I would literally go drive to a store, buy stuff, usually in the middle of the night, eat it to the point of just disgust and then literally vomit it out, come back, fall asleep, and then try and repeat that day and starve myself, try and fast, try and exercise all the calories. And then it would just be overeating in the evening, right? To make me feel a certain way, as well as trying to get my body the nutrients it wants, right? So it's a mm -hmm. weird combination. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, food is a very interesting conversation because it becomes very personal, right? And I think like being someone who did struggle with bulimia myself, it almost becomes like closet eating where you're ashamed to admit how much you've eaten or what you've eaten. And so you try to hide it completely. And I do think that that's what helps me at least anyways, be more relatable to my clients because I'm like, you can tell me and nothing's going to surprise me, right? It just, I just want you to be honest with me about what you've consumed and how you're feeling um, you know, where you are on that emotional spectrum and how that's influencing your choices, where you are in terms of your stress levels and how that's influencing your food choices, because I can completely understand so many of the different, um, I guess, nuances of eating, whether it be trying to restrict your calories to look a certain way, whether it be absolutely overeating to the point of feeling sick and ashamed of yourself. Um, I understand feeling pressured in social settings to eat in front of other people because they're doing that. And it, it's weird not to, even if you don't necessarily want to eat the food that they're eating, that was a big one for me. So I went through kind of different stages like you did with food. It started off with um, binge eating uh, where I would severely restrict myself and then overeat. That turned into bulimia very quickly. When my mom found me puking when I was in my very early 20s, I was home visiting. I was so ashamed by her reaction um, to me doing that, that I actually just, it, it almost cut me cold turkey on it. Um, but it, that turned into a serious issue because it meant that I was barely eating at all, right? It didn't solve the problem. It just meant that I was very underweight by the end of that period of my life. Um, and then after that, when I did start, I would, after my first yoga teacher training, um, we had three meals a day. I was present with other people for all those meals. I wasn't able to like sneak things into my little tent on the beach. Right. It was like, there was no availability to that food. And that's really honestly what healed my eating disorder was because I was so, I was so focused on like my mind body connection. 
I was actually starting for the first time to listen to my hunger and satiety and like eat to a point where I felt comfortable because we just had food available to us there. But the other yoga, you know, the other yogis that were practicing with me and in that yoga teacher training were sitting down with plates where I was like kind of like copying what they were doing, right? And then starting to figure it out for myself of like, okay, this is what normal portion sizes are. This is what's healthy. Um, and I just lost touch with that. And so being in that setting where I actually couldn't get extra food after, you know, the kitchen was closed, it was like, okay, cool. Now I'm starting to listen to that. And I would wake up feeling good. I wake up feeling hungry and that really helped me. Um, and not everyone has that opportunity to live off grid for a month in a tent, um, where someone else is controlling your food. But that was a, a massive, um, that had a massive positive impact for me. And coming out of that though, I actually really struggled with, um, what I call basically orthorexia, where you're obsessed with healthy eating. Because obviously in that yoga teacher training, all we had was healthy food, right? Fruit, rice, fish, vegetables, eggs. We had nothing that was unhealthy that entire month. And so when I came out of that, I felt like this massive aversion to anything that was quote unquote unhealthy or not like a raw or vegan or something like that. Right. And yeah. so that in itself was damaging because now I had a hard time enjoying myself in social settings, going home to eat. Even I was always questioning what was in that food or, you know, worried that there was going to be gluten or some scary dairy or something in there. Right. And so I had this like fear of food that I couldn't control. And so that was really limiting in itself. So I, I know that for a lot of people, my experience of going through these, this like spectrum of disordered eating um, helps me to be more relatable I know for yourself as well. So I know you talked about like going to the store and getting these foods that, you know, you would overeat and then feel guilty for those foods themselves are actually very sophisticated. It's sophisticated food engineering. And do you want to touch on that a little bit as a holistic nutritionist? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's a whole conversation of itself. Like there's books written about this. Uh, the one that when I read um, really blew my mind, it's called the Dorito effect. Uh, so literally this one guy, he's a journalist. His name is Mark Schatz, Schatzter. And he goes into the science of when did this all started essentially. And how there's literally degrees for this kind of stuff, right? So there's scientists, food scientists that get their PhDs and try and figure out. So these companies like Doritos, for example, many others hire these people who are very smart with chemistry, right? And they try and figure out what can we put together here to make it super addictive so you could have one more. The whole saying for most of these chip companies or Doritos, like you can't just have one, right? And that's true. It's very hard to just have one. And that goes for most processed food. It's engineered that way specifically, right? Um, at the beginning, it started out with just, you know, being able, this all started the agricultural revolution, essentially, when humans started, stopped being nomadic and they set place, started farming practices and, you know, preventing essentially malnutrition on a global level, right? Trying to create food that offers a ton of calories, some nutrients, to prevent that from happening so more people can eat it but at the end of the day the the intention behind it was true and and, and there was a lot of merit to it right mm -hmm. it was it was good intention but the thing is it's taken to an extreme because there's a lot of money to be made and there's there's not a lot of nutrients right if you actually break it down and a lot of these stuff we talked about this is sort of fortified with food, with vitamins and minerals that that make it even worse if we want to break it down further right so these foods <laughs> you can't how i explain it to most people is like thousand calories right we've talked about this too you can get a thousand calories from a starbucks drink you could literally sip that in 30 seconds if you really wanted to and you're not going to be satiated you're going to want to eat more it's the same thing you can't just have one piece of pizza you're going to want to have more and more it's not filling unless you have really good willpower but that willpower will eventually fade away right whereas if you compare that with a real real, real meal with real ingredients good balance of you know amino acids protein fats essential fatty acids you're going to be good to go and you're going to be able to have, it all comes down to your wiring, your ghrelin and leptin levels, right? Ghrelin being that hormone that signals hunger, right? But that gets, or so that gets essentially cut, cut off by leptin, which signals satiety, but that is only on a cellular level when your cells are filled with nutrients, right? And this doesn't happen with these foods. There's no food in nature that has a combination of salt, fat, and sugar, right? The only thing that would come close to that actually would be dairy, right? But we only consume dairy when we're growing as infants, right? It's there for us to grow, right? Some people would even argue that nuts and seeds technically have fat. Okay, they don't have salt, but they have amount of carbohydrates in them as well, right? And most animals eat nuts and seeds to fatten up before the winter, right? Because of the high linoleic acid in them. 
And that's where the conversation gets a little nuanced, but these foods have been engineered specifically to make us want to eat more. It's almost that hedonic treadmill we talk about because it invokes euphoria, right? We eat it and we feel really good transiently, but then we obviously usually sometimes crash. Maybe we get hypoglycemia. We're just not satisfied. So we eat more. Some people, you know, we've had clients log their food journals and they'll have like a donut, right? They'll have these weird snacks throughout the day because it's that quick fix, right? Makes them feel good. That dopamine, that serotonin, and then crashes, right? It's never fulfilling. And then they keep snacking and throughout the day, they're not eating the proper meals. Like you mentioned, when you were secluded for a month, you were able to reestablish a good relationship with food because you didn't have that external input, those external foods coming in. So you're able to actually give yourself a break from it. And then when you go back to it, then you you realize the damage, right? Mm -hmm. And and the, the sinister, the sinisterness behind it, it's like it's it's not food, it doesn't nourish you, it actually creates a lot of anxiety. If you're actually in tune with your hunger hormones and if you're in tune with the relationship with food with real food and processed food because a lot of people can't make that they yeah. can't decipher that right so a, a breakfast actually that i just want to bring forward to your attention um, and i was raised on cereal bless my parents souls because they were doing their best with Same. three kids um, i was raised on cereal like frosted flakes and fruit loops my parents tried to do things like you know get whole milk and mix in some oats with our cereal so we're getting more fiber and stuff or throw some berries in there but we ate cereal okay and that um, is a very easy food to like overeat and that actually was one of the foods that i would overeat um if i was to like binge eat would act actually be cereal but when i was growing up i was told that cereal was healthy right so you look for the one that says whole grain or high in protein or something like that but those things are loaded with refined carbohydrates sodium even really high in sugar um, and then they're even fortified with different things like we've we've talked about before and actually we're going to do a podcast um, next actually on iron and uh, those like inflammatory states within your body within your gut can actually create more issues around your hunger and signal hunger signaling and satiety when your when your body is inflamed it's essentially stressed right um, and that stress response within your body will cause you to look for more food right and it's usually that food that it wants for like quick energy so it's typically something that's sugary or sweet right and when you're in that state and it's easy to stop at the gas station and the gas station isn't well stocked with fruit maybe they have some bananas on the front counter but there's a bunch of candy bars available to you that's the first thing that you're going to grab right um so i know cereal for me was a really big one and so if you're someone that eats cereal in the mornings um try switching up your breakfast that will probably actually really help you to um, improve your relationship with food because starting your day with a, a meal that is going to drive that like jake said hedonic um, tre hold on a treadmill, I think you called it, um, then that's going to help you, right? So having a better balanced breakfast will definitely help. For me, stopping skipping meals is a big one. Um, that really helped me with my relationship with food because I was like, okay, I can eat more later if I eat less now, right? Or, you know, I ate too much last night, so I just won't eat this morning. And that's a, a really damaged, that really damaged my relationship with food um, doing that. And so for me now, it's like, even if I don't necessarily feel super hungry in the morning, um, I make an effort to even have something small, right. And just get something in my stomach, um, get that hunger and satiety signaling going because I can easily get addicted to stress hormones and skip meals. Right. And then I pay for it later. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about just even for yourself, like how you mean to have a, a kind of homeostatic relationship with food now? Um, I know it's a bit different because right now you're actually working really hard on your hormone health and, and coming off um, your TRT. And so that's affecting your hunger and satiety. But um, even just before that, just talking about kind of how you structure yourself, because you're a little different than me, like you can have a bigger um, break between meals. I personally find that it's very triggering to some of my past um, negative relationship with food if I do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've tried all the different things and I've obviously had a pretty skewed relationship to food and it actually did come up when we did this, when I did the show in April, it creeped up on me and I'd want, I'd have those subconscious programming coming in, right? When you're really stressed, um, especially me, food obviously helps with that specific food, carbohydrates, translate help because when we're stressed, cortisol goes up, adrenaline can go up as well. So we feel good. We could get addicted to it, like you mentioned, but one of the things that works really well in numbing that temporarily is carbohydrates, right? Quick fuel. Right, because it elevates insulin, and insulin is in a converse rela uh, inverse relationship with cortisol. So, the more insulin we have, the less cortisol. Right, that's why insulin is one of the most anabolic hormones for bodybuilders. Right, keeps their stress levels low too. But that's another tangent. Um, so for me, it did creep up, but never get back to the point where it was like binging, binging. It was just a little bit more calories than what I needed to because of stressful events, especially when I had the injury to my wrist. 
and being on the hormones too definitely skews your relationship it made me feel a certain way it made me feel good and that made me feel like more of a man how i should be feeling and now coming off of them i'm realizing that my hunger is actually less i don't have that drive to eat as much it's a different kind of environment to navigate the different landscape but i think it's one uh, a normal one because when you're taking super physiological doses even if i was within the range it's still more than potentially what my body wants me to be at right and this is the interesting thing with hormones is anytime we manipulate hormones there's a downstream effect of things. And do we know what that's going to be? No, for me, I noticed it was for sure hunger. Right away, I've noticed that my appetite isn't the same. And I could go longer periods of time without food because that's what I did for years. I could get away with eating like two meals a day as opposed to structure three, four, five meals. I've had phases, years where I'm eating six meals a day, right? And I've tried all different things. And I just, I'm more in tune with my body. You know, I've tried doing the breakfast, lunch, dinner. Some days I could do that works well for me. I don't like snacking. My philosophy is a little bit different. doesn't work for everybody, right? I don't think humans are grazers. We're not like cattle or need to be eating every hour or two hours. Um, I, I subscribe almost to that belief of, and I, I'll context this in a second, that we as humans ate when we had food available to us. We had periods of time where we could go without food, feast, famine kind of thing. Fasting, I think that's taken to an extreme. That works in the context of not having all other stressors, right? And we talked about this before. It's like we're bombarded with stress, right? So it's almost imperative that we consume somewhat frequently throughout the day at least when we do consume even if it's a bigger meal we're consuming good nutrients to satiate us and give us the nutrients we need to balance that homeostasis right um so we could segue this into a little bit of fasting because i think this is a big craze and i think this is not the, the right play for a lot of people as you do get addicted to the stress hormones and then that eventually backfires we see this time and time again uh, for women, more so because you can't handle stress as much as men, that buffer of testosterone helps a lot. At least I found in my pers personal uh, experience working with people. But for me, what works for me doesn't work for somebody else. You have to find what works for you, for your lifestyle, and what works for your your eating times, right? Like I'm not eating small little meals. You see me eat when, I, when I'm eating two meals a day. They're pretty big meals. I still get my calories and I get my nutrients in. Is it the best long term? Maybe not. But for the period of time that I do it, it tends to work for me, right? You're different right? You mm -hmm. need your three meals, your structured meals, and it works for you. Otherwise you have a trigger, right? Potentially. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting because when we went on holidays for three weeks, I've just been so comfortable in my routine, you know, waking up, having a small meal or some juice before I go train, getting back, having breakfast, having lunch, having dinner. I'm not a snacker either. Um, I definitely used to be because I wouldn't fuel myself properly. So then I had a higher affinity to snack. Um, it was actually brutal when I was vegetarian. I always felt like I needed to snack on things, but I think it was just my body's internal, uh, you know, screaming essentially for more nutrients right? Because I was obviously very nutrient deprived. I wasn't doing vegetarian properly. Um, I didn't know as much as I know now. So uh, I used to be a snacker. I'm not anymore. I don't think that it's good for gut health. I think that humans do go through or did used to go through periods of feast and famine. Like Drake said, they don't have the same stressors as we do now. But on holiday for three weeks, um, there were some, some days where I would eat maybe like breakfast or lunch, not one or the other, and then not eat again until dinner. And it's not that that's necessarily bad. It's just that I got the most severe stomach pain I have literally had in like years, right? And it was like almost like that searing kind of pain. It was like bulimia, but like amplified, like serious, serious stomach pain. Um, and I was trying to figure it out, honestly. And I thought about it a couple of times. And I think potentially there is some long-term damage to my stomach lining from under eating, severely being bulimic, um, the antibiotics that I was on. And when you're really hungry um, and in the anticipation of food, your body actually starts to produce uh, ghrelin, obviously, but then it starts to produce more hydrochloric acid in the anticipation of food, especially if you like sit down at a restaurant, and you're like thinking about eating and you're like looking at the menu, right? And that's what we were doing. Um, and so in that instance, I would start to get stomach pain before I even started eating. And then that pain would be amplified after I ate to the point where I like wanted to curl up in a ball. And I think that part of it has to do with the body signaling for like breaking down food. You've been fasting for a while. We're going to have a big meal, more hydrochloric acid, but I couldn't handle that because I haven't, I wasn't used to it. I'm not, I haven't done that in a long time, years, years and years, because I've been really focused on being routine with my food rather than reactive to how I, how I feel right? Because I was a very reactive person. I feel fat today, so I'm not going to eat. But instead of that, you know, I make sure that it doesn't matter what time of the month it is for me, whether I feel good or bad in my body, I maintain a very neutral relationship with my food. This is how much I'm eating. These are my meal times, 
right? And that helps me um, psychologically not to be super reactive and, uh, you know, end up in a negative spiral with food. I think part of it though as well um, was almost like taking me back to that emotional spiral around avoiding food. And it was almost like there was some unsolved pain or trauma in my stomach that I hadn't digested. And I'm a bit of a woo-woo. Um, so I do think that if we don't fully heal from past pain or experiences, those things resurface for us. And I think that potentially there are still issues for me around food avoidance or relationship with food that maybe I still need to work through, right? And like skipping meals brings that up for me because it is still a bit of a trigger for me. Um, so I think that part of that pain is maybe um, more psychological, which is, I think, very fascinating. Um, maybe you agree or disagree with that. No, I 100% agree. And, you know, we're, we're very transparent. And for me, it's, it's for sure, uh, trauma based, um, we don't have to get into the conversation of that family love, like being loved, feeling loved, loving yourself, especially somebody who's, you know, didn't like their body, right, and then changed and they're eating changed with that, you know, that stays with you. And if you have certain triggers that bring up those emotions, that you've had, then, you know, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. I'm working on this too, because I find myself um, sometimes gravitating towards food I shouldn't be eating. And it's more so the hedonic thing, it, but not more so the hedonic. It's, it, I don't want to explore those feelings as much. So I, I guess I use the food to numb it out, right? Because I don't, like a lot of us, and I've talked about this to clients, have, have a hard time being with ourselves alone, right? Without distraction, without music, without podcasts, we don't spend a lot of time with ourselves and a lot of people don't want to because then emotions come up, right? A lot of us don't want to do that deep work and it requires a lot of effort and a lot of time and being very, very persistent with it. Right. And until that's resolved, I don't know if I'll be resolved for myself. It's just the, the, how I deal with it will be better. I, for me, it's not loving myself fully. I haven't worked through that yet based off of my past, but it's something that isn't on anybody else. The onus is on me, right? It's just, I haven't done the work to fully heal myself based off of things that have happened, right? And how long that's going to take, I don't know. But I think that's a big thing for a lot of people is those traumas, right? And whenever things come up that get those feelings that have happened in the past elevated, the same kind of event or emotions that they felt, then food, and if they've used food in the past, they're probably going to use food now, right? And I've, over the last few years, I thought I got to the point where I've almost ameliorated those feelings, but clearly not. So obviously, I need to do a little bit more work. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, just like full transparency in, in our relationship, I challenge Jake on a lot of things um, yeah. and uh, challenging him to feel loved is definitely one of those things. Um, I, I have a feeling his partners in the past back down a lot more quickly than I do. Um, I hold my ground pretty good. So uh, <laughs> I definitely challenge him to uh, be more accepting of, of love and attention, which is something that is easy to shut down, avoid, and, and obviously turn to food in, in the um, obviously the presence of those uncomfortable emotions where we don't want to feel something or we're in avoidance behavior. Um, I had talked on a lot of podcasts about relationship with food and um, I think avoidance and numbing are, are really high up there on reasons for people eating, you know, and also if you don't have a lot of fun or pleasure in your life, you know, food might actually be that thing. And it might be really hard to take away that fun, exciting meal that you have planned or on the weekend when you don't have anything else fun or exciting going on. Right. So sometimes it is about creating more space in your life for like pleasure, enjoyment um, that doesn't come from food. And so I even say to my clients, like make non, non, um, eating plans, like non-social eating plans, uh, sorry, non-eating social plans. That's what I was trying to go for. Um, so we're like, you go out and like do something fun. Like maybe you go bowling or, you know, you go for a walk or a hike, or you like plan something with them, right? You go mini golfing rather than just being like, Hey, let's meet up for a drink or some food, right? Because that very quickly becomes a situation where we're now being pressured potentially into eating somewhere we maybe don't want to, or, you know, your friends like, Hey, let's share the nachos. And you feel like the asshole if you say no, right? Like those kind of situations. And they like, well, don't put yourself in those situations as much, especially when you're trying to heal your relationship with food, try to, I mean, I look, at least for me, it really helped to eat out less at first and then to slowly reintegrate that. Right. And to also be the person who's inviting the other person. So I'm like, Hey, do you want to meet me here for lunch? Right. Cause then you have the chance to like, give yourself a little bit more opportunity to decide how and what you're going to eat. Right. And that's not always possible. Um, but I do think that it's something that helped me for a long time. I just avoided eating out because I was just scared of anything that wasn't super healthy, um, quote unquote. So that was a big issue for me. Um, now let's talk a little bit about those homeostatic kind of hormones. 
So there's a couple of big ones that come up, obviously ghrelin. Um, I just think of ghrelin like little goblin in your tummy. I don't know why that comes up for me, gremlins in your tummy, um, hungry, and then leptin, um, which is essentially our satiety hormone. Now, interestingly enough, high stress hormones will actually blunt your satiety, your leptin, and they'll drive up something called NPY. And NPY is actually neuropeptide Y, which is a hormone that drives you specifically to find carbohydrates. So that is obviously to, as Jake talks about that inverse relationship between insulin and cortisol. So if your cortisol levels are high, it would make sense that with it, it drives up that NPY or neuropeptide Y so that you can actually get some carbs in you to calm down the cortisol. It makes sense that your body would be designed that way. Um, but you need to understand those things for yourself because let's say, for example, you've just undergone some kind of stress. Let's say, for example, um, someone cut you off in traffic. You're feeling really pissed off. <laughs> I don't know. You got in this fight with your, your partner. Rather than like waiting for that stress to completely come down and then being ravenous or eating your emotions, have something small like a piece of fruit or a cup of juice to kind of calm that, calm that down and give your body an opportunity to reset before you decide what to eat. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's a recommendation I have for people that are like high stress and like have something small in terms of carbohydrates and then wait half an hour and see how you feel and then make that decision to eat. Um, and you probably will have a little bit better hunger and satiety signaling. Um, also with ghrelin, there are certain things that will drive up ghrelin as well. Um, uh, honestly, not eating for a long period of time is going to drive up your ghrelin. Um, that's going to be the one. Is there anything else um, that kind of comes to mind in terms of like stimulating ghrelin? Yeah, for sure. Sleep deprivation. Um, mm. That'll do it. 100%. You know, I missing something. Yeah. Isn't it like people are more likely to eat anywhere from 300 to 500 calories more than they usually would when they're underslept? I don't know the exact numbers, but probably even higher than that. Honestly, it's super yeah. easy to consume that um, sleep. Yeah. Over exercising, like over stressing yourself for sure. Um, but then, you know, this is an interesting thing because sleep, if you're sleep deprived as well, that can make you almost like a type two diabetics or insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. And then you're craving carbs as well, which it's almost like a double whammy because then your body isn't actually utilizing those carbs efficiently. You might have a hypoglycemic event. Then you'll want more carbs. You're in this vicious cycle mm. and then eating at nighttime too, right? Usually you're more insulin resistant in the evening, right? When the sun sets, um, because melatonin goes up and melat when melatonin goes up, your body pretty much shuts down insulin secretion, right? From your beta cells. So it's, it, you have to find what works for you. I know if I'm stressed, um, having a little bit of carbs for sure helps me. I know some people like actually amplify that as well, uh, which is pretty interesting, especially if they're like not metabolically flexible, if they can't utilize glucose fairly efficiently. Um, but in terms of what else can elevate ghrelin, I think the, the big ones would be overstressing, not eating for long periods of time, sleep deprivation. And I think even potentially thought alone, right? Just getting yeah. your head about it. Thinking about food. Yeah. Hyper-focusing on food potentially. Um, interesting about thing about leptin, you guys, is that it, people that have the most body fat have the highest amounts of leptin, um, which would seem silly because you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. Wouldn't they just be full? Why are they overeating? You can be leptin resistant the same way you can be insulin resistant. And so if you have body fat that goes above the healthier normal ranges, your body fat is now working to get more of it, right? It's almost like fat cells are like, yeah, let's have more of us. So they're producing this uh, leptin, but what's essentially at the beginning, when you are a healthy weight, normal weight, within that healthy body fat percentage range, the, as you reach that healthy body fat percentage, that leptin and ghrelin hunger satiety signaling is going to help you maintain that body. And that's your homeostasis. But once you put on too much body fat, your body's producing more and more of the leptin, which is essentially your satiety hormone, but it's no longer making you feel satiated. It is now actually causing your body to have this um, mechanism where there's resistance, right? To that leptin. So your body's like kind of ignoring it and then it's easier to overeat. So that's another kind of like catch 22. It's like the heavier you get, the more body fat you have, the easier it is to overeat. And so sometimes you do have to fight against your body's hormones in that initial fat loss phase to get into a healthy weight. Um, or a healthy range. And that first initial few months might be really challenging because you will, you will potentially constantly feel like you want more food. You'll never really get that true satiety signaling. And that's, that honestly is, is difficult because if you don't have that, you're always going to want more of that snack, right? After dinner, you had a big meal, you still have a snack. 
So that in and of itself is something to understand, especially if you're listening to this, you're overweight, you're over, I mean, for women, I say over 25%. I think for men, I want to say like over 20% body fat. Um, I'd say probably that's, that's like the healthy 20 range to 25. Right? for men. Yeah. 25 getting up there. Right. It Does depends it as to, well because up to 30% for women. I think a little bit higher than that. It depends where you start your body fat too. Right. So, yeah. um, which is interesting, but I think for men, 20 at uh, the high end, 30 for women, maybe even higher a little bit for women. I'd have to double check that one. Yeah. I mean, everyone's set point is going to be slightly different, but once you do start pushing into like um, metabolic syndrome, obesity, then definitely that signaling is off. But then at the same time, um, if your body's inflamed, you're going to struggle with insulin sensitivity. Inflammation can really disrupt that cell signaling. And so that can also pose issues around your blood sugar regulation. Um, and like those big blood sugar crashes that Jake talked about. So uh, honestly, some of the best things you can do to improve your homeostatic relationship with food would be to start having like structured meal times and not skip skip meals. That's something that really helped me because at the yoga teacher training, we had breakfast at 9 a.m. We had lunch at 1230. We had dinner at five. I think in the afternoon we had a break, but the break that, that what was available to us was basically fruit. Have a piece of fruit, right? And some water. Um, and those were our only three times a day to eat with those snack, that one afternoon snack, and that was it. So giving yourself guidelines for when you're eating and when you're not eating and having structured meals um, is a good place to start. And the second thing I would say is single ingredient whole foods. So really avoiding the processed foods. And I think people don't really even understand processed foods. Can you maybe just talk about like food processing and because people will, you know, look at whole wheat bread and think, ha you know, healthy. Um, so maybe let's just touch on that. Yeah, I mean, everything these days is processed, right? Technically, right? Technically, our meat has been processed. But I mean, there's levels to it. Most of the time, they're taking a food in its whole food form and then taking it through many iterations to get it to why, essentially. So let's say you have your whole grain, right? Um, let's say you have your wheat that's growing, pulverize it, pulverize it again, put it into this fine powder. Um, and sometimes they'll bleach that powder for like white bread, for example, and then they'll fortify it with minerals and vitamins, which usually your body cannot recognize, right? So it's many steps away from its whole food form, right? So like if you're to eat, for example, an almond, whole almonds, just almonds, the, the end stage of that could potentially be them pulverizing it, putting it into a, a, a flour and then bleaching it for the most part, almond flour, right? So um, most of the food is processed these days, like anything that's in a package essentially is processed to a certain degree, right? And a lot of it is is processed in the sense that it's so far taken away from its whole food that you're pretty much just getting the end product, right? A lot of the fiber nutrients are stripped from it and you try to re-fortify it. So your body can essentially break it down, right? Depending on where your digestion is. The thing is, most people cannot digest these foods and most people um, not only can they not digest it, but the thing is, when we talk about that hedonic eating, these foods are fortified and put together, right? When something is processed and stripped from its whole food form, it's easier to digest and break down as well. And if it's been stripped of those vitamins and minerals, for the most part it is, then your body's not getting that satiety signal from leptin essentially, right? Your cells aren't like, all right, cool. I'm getting like, I always tell people food is like a barcode, right? Your body, your body scans it. It's like, all right, cool. I'm getting my B vitamins. I'm getting my zinc. I'm getting my amino acids, my essential fatty acids. I'm good. When it's scanning processed food, for example, cereal, what is cereal? It's not just like ground up wheat. They put sugars in there. They put emulsifiers in there. They put fortified vitamins and minerals in there. They'll put other agents in there as well, right? So it could be shelf stable. And so that it's more hyper palatable that puts salt in there as well. But the thing is with salt, it's not like they're putting a good quality salt in there. They're just putting sodium chloride in there, which is table salt, right? Which your body can't really recognize. So then it depletes you of potassium and you have all this downstream effects, which makes your body want to eat more food, right? Because it's not food that's coming in nature that your body could recognize, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Those processed foods um, heavily impact your leptin and ghrelin. They will suppress, yeah, it suppresses your leptin. Like like Jake said, it's going to read the food and go, hey, this isn't everything I need. Like, we're not going to tell you that you're full yet. You need more, you need more nutrients. You're not, you haven't hit your threshold for what your body needs. Um, and so there's, I personally think that the best thing you can do for your body is limit processed food. And I wouldn't say that it needs to be like 100% perfect all the time. Um, that just pushes you into eating with a, an orthorexic pattern um, where you now have an unhealthy relationship with healthy food. 
But I think at the beginning, especially if you're someone that eats a lot of processed food and eats a lot of junk food, fast food, eats, you know, eats when you're stressed, eats when you're emotional, eats at weird times of day, doesn't have a regular eating schedule. The best thing you can do is have a regular eating schedule and only eat single and whole, whole single ingredient whole foods. I want to say for like a couple of weeks, right? And then start to reintegrate, reintegrate those other things for yourself um, slowly, right? And not and, and giving yourself that opportunity to like eat a good quality whole food meal and then say, hey, do you still want the Kit Kat? Because like nine times out of 10, the answers, I want to see the answers would be no, but for most people, the answer is probably yes. But like, do you still truly crave the Kit Kat? Or are you just thinking, hey, that would be nice? Because now you're going to actually recognize the difference between eating for homeostasis and eating for pleasure. And once you can identify those two things in and of, in yourself, now it's a lot easier to make food choices. Do I need this? No. Do I want this right now? Yes. And then you can kind of go through those steps within yourself of like, okay, if I eat this right now, um, am I eating it for enjoyment or am I eating it for some other reason, right? Am I eating it simply to avoid how I'm feeling or to try to numb myself from something else? And now you can start kind of checking off that list. No, I just want to eat it for enjoyment. Okay, now this is where discipline comes in, right? Is it an everyday thing where that you're eating for enjoyment or are you just giving yourself permission to do that when it makes sense for you? Like for me, I was on holiday for the last three weeks. Did I eat every chocolate bar and ice cream that I saw? No, but did I allow myself to have like some really like fun coffees that I don't usually have with like some cream on them and stuff that it's like something I don't usually eat? Yeah, I did, right? And I didn't beat myself up for that because it was like a choice, but if you're not making empowered choices around food and you're letting food control you, that's where you're going to be in a really, really difficult place um, with your relationship with food. Food shouldn't control you. I agree. Yeah. Um, do you have any final words, conclusions, anything else you want to touch on? Yeah, I think people, and I've, I've dealt with this myself, is I didn't understand what true hunger was, right? I think most people don't actually understand what true hunger is. They're just eating habitually and for a feeling, right? Um, I'm not recommending this, but for me, what really shifted my things was two things, actually doing a prolonged fast. And the only context I would ever do that in was with zero stress, right? When I was at the cottage, when I didn't, when I wasn't working, I could just relax, sleep, drink water, swim a little bit, walk, and actually reestablish what real hunger is because you truly feel that after a few days. Right. And then doing a carnivore diet helped me because I don't recommend this for everybody, for people who have had potentially uh, some type of digestive issues, right? Maybe eating disorders, it could be a trigger for some people, but allowed me to reestablish what actual fullness felt like satiety at the point where, wow, I eat this and I'm like, I can't even finish eating this. Right. Cause meat is very satiating pretty much has everything you need in it. Right. Those two things helped me a lot, but obviously there's still some triggers there. But one thing I would say is I think people don't actually know what real hunger is, right? And they're eating just habitually and to the point of just getting a, a certain emotion or feeling going. Um, so I would actually urge people if they're actually hungry, let's say you're doing a calorie deficit, like be okay with that feeling, right? It's not a bad feeling, especially if you're eating, you have your coach or whatever, giving out your meal plan, like be okay with that feeling. Um, because if you just give into it every single time, then you're never going to get be successful and essentially want to lose fat if that's your goal. Because a lot of people want to lose body fat, but once hunger comes in right away, they're like they panic and they want to eat something right away. But it's like that's a normal human feeling, right? Mm -hmm. We should be we should be hungry. Most of human evolution, we probably were hungry most of the time, right? We weren't satiated, and I think people are scared when that emotion comes up. I think we've talked about this before, and it's like being okay with that. That's okay. okay. You're not going to die. Right? It's, okay. it's okay to be hungry. Um, yeah. I mean, I would say don't get addicted to that feeling of being hungry. If you're trying to lose no. weight, that's another, it's like a double-edged sword, right? You're like, Ooh, being hungry means fat loss. Um, to a certain extent, depending on your stress levels, it can. But I think that when it comes to hunger, like Jake said, it's not going to kill you. Um, be okay with it. And initially it might feel really, really uncomfortable if you haven't actually experienced it for a long time and you've been overeating for some time. That first like real true hunger is going to slap you in the face, <laughs> right? And so you need to sit with that. Um, and there may be some uncomfortable emotions too that come up with um, not eating food, 
Um, and you may realize that very quickly that some of your nighttime snacking habits or, um, you know, midday, mid-afternoon snacks are really more so coping mechanisms than they are, you know, you actually seeking out nutrients. So be aware of that. Um, Jake, uh, always a pleasure chatting to you. I get to talk to you every day. That's a blessing. Um, but thank you for sharing your time on the podcast and for also sharing your you know, your story, um, never a comfortable story to share. I know for a lot of people, this conversation is very personal. So thank you for coming here and being vulnerable with me and with everybody else. Of course. Thank you for bringing me on again. Appreciate yeah, you. Of course. Uh, where can everybody find you? Yeah. My main is, uh, Instagram, jake.beast. Facebook is just Jake, my last name, my <laughs> Actually, It's actually yeah. Jacob. It's actually Jacob on Facebook. Be careful. And it's Jacob. spelled, yeah, J-A-K-U-B, not yeah. L-B. J not J-O-C-O-B. Yeah. Um, but Instagram is definitely the place where I'm at. So Cool. Love that. Thank you so much for being here. All right, you guys. Peace, love, and personal growth. And we'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you for tuning in to the E3 podcast and sharing your valuable time with me. I hope that you learned something new. And if you found value in this episode, the number one thing you can do to support the show is share this episode with a friend that would benefit from it too. If you'd like to find out more about the lifestyle programs we offer online at Health Pillars, shoot me an email about your current situation to info at healthpillars.ca and we'll see what we can do to help. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you never miss a weekly episode.